Good morning, everyone. I'm Kay Swinburne, Chair of the IRSG Council and Vice Chair of Financial Services at KPMG. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the new IRSG report, The Future of International Data Transfers. The report has been written by the IRSG Data Committee with support from KPMG. Thank you to our speakers and panelists for giving up their valuable time to join us today. And I'm pleased to welcome Emma Bate from the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, who will give us a keynote speech uh, today. So I am going to start by um, saying that we will have an expert panel chaired by Vivian Arts, who will follow uh, both the comments by Emma and Isabel, and will discuss some of the findings. And as has been second nature with these events, I will begin with a bit of housekeeping. Um, please be aware that today's event is being recorded and may be shared on our digital platform in the coming days. We'd like the panel session to be interactive. So please post any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll endeavor to answer some of them later in the session. Now, if you have any technical issues, then please post your query in the chat box and the technical team will try to assist you. And finally, you will receive a link to the report after today's event. Now, before I hand over to Emma and Isabel, I will firstly like to say a few words on the significance of this report. Financial services is one of the most digitized sectors of the economy. And within that, data is ever so critical. Unhindered and smooth cross-border movement is essential. As part of this digital transformation, we're also seeing more data regulation, with over two thirds of countries globally having implemented or are implementing privacy and data protection laws. The pace of change also creates a number of challenges, including differences in our response to how to regulate data. Then the differing regimes between jurisdictions may increase the barriers to trade. This leaves us with a patchwork that we currently have for international data transfers, which is ineffective and is far behind what we need for an increasingly digital economy. It was in response to these challenges, the IRSG in partnership with KPMG has undertaken this work. At its core, the report argues for a global standard on international data transfers. The report explores what is the current trajectory of current data transfer restrictions and the impact that this could have on financial services firms and their customers. It also proposes a number of recommendations to better achieve a consistent level of protection to allow data flows today and in the digital world of the future. Those guiding principles and recommendations have been arrived at following extensive engagement with stakeholders, national and global regulators, and indeed the standard setters. And I'd like to finish by thanking everyone who has got involved, and in particular my own firm, KPMG, who have held the pen on this report. Your contributions have been invaluable in building a comprehensive view of the steps that the industry, regulators and policymakers can all begin to take to facilitate responsible data sharing and support data protection standards. We look forward to working with you as we seek to take the report's recommendations forwards. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Emma Bate, the Director of Legal Services at the Information Commissioner's Office for her keynote spe speech. Emma, over to you. Thanks, Kay, and thank you all for inviting me to provide this address on the launch of such an interesting, and I think we could all agree it's such an essential paper. Um, everyone in this virtual room, I think, knows the importance of transfers of data to the global economy and to the UK economy. And perhaps given everything else that's happened, what we don't need is a block on transfers and an additional, additional economic hit. And when later on, I'm going to talk about Article A, the right to privacy in the European Convention of Human Rights, wider societal rights and needs, that economic hit, that potential economic hit has to be taken into consideration. I'm one of um, a band of brothers at the ICO uh, who seem to spend most of our waking hours thinking about data transfers. So frankly, if we can come up with some straightforward 
global solutions, I personally will be very grateful as there are times when I would like to think about something else. Um, and I, I don't think we at the ICO would have any disagreement with the starting point of this paper. We need a rethink of our approach to international transfers and the challenge which this paper addresses today is what should be those short and long-term goals for particularly the financial services sector. Like many of you today, I've been working in data protection law for about 20 years, and I had frequently used SCCs in contracts before I joined the ICO. Um, Hand on heart, I think we all knew that the SCC safe harbour and indeed privacy shield were flawed systems. And I think the CJU decision came as no surprise to most of us that exporters should really be taking some steps to check that the SCCs will provide appropriate safeguards in practice. But I think what's now been taxing us all is this requirement for exporters to take into consideration both the contractual clauses and the assessment of the local legal framework for access by public authorities. Before we had SHREMS 2, I think it's fair to say that the data community, data protection community in general, we hadn't really wanted to impact the regime on international transfers. And I think we'd stashed it at the back of a too hard, maybe later shelf. And we just carried on entering into our SCC, sticking them at the back of a contract, and you know that was that was our job done, and, and maybe getting on with something more interesting as a data protection lawyer. But I think, or oh, and I think the report echoes this: that the responsibility rests with all of us to make sure that we don't do that again. It's for government, it's for regulators, and it's for you, data protection professionals. In the long run, it's going to do us no favors if we don't come up with a workable international framework for international transfers which provides appropriate protection for individuals. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves right back at the start again with the SHREMS 3 or a similar kind of case. At the ICO, our aim is to support a, an international transfers regime, which first of all, enables global data flows. Secondly, which will provide the appropriate level of protection for individuals. And thirdly, can be used by different types and sizes of exporters and importers. There are so many challenges built into those three very simple aims, but I'm just going to pose a few of them for you. And I think there's more that are put forward in the paper itself. So we need a regime that can be used by all kinds of business and organizations from the very smallest micro businesses to the multinational. And it's obvious to say this, I think, but the model before SHREMS 2 um, was, was a one size fits all model and we can't go back to that. We need different options and different pipelines. The next challenge is what is this baseline level of protection for individuals and what is the risk test that comes in that assessment of the, the local regime? Um, in our consultation, we've built into that test a risk of harm and we're going to intend to continue it with that. But I think the next question then comes, which we're thinking about at the moment, is how closely linked must be the risks associated with data access to actual harm? So, for example, if a public authority does sweep up data and then takes harmful action against an individual, is it the data that caused the harm? Would it have happened anyway? Does any of that matter? I don't have any answers to that at the moment. And then finally, Another challenge is how can these protections be enforced, in particular by the individuals? Um, I'm going to use a really helpful analogy, which a very learned barrister came up with, so I can't claim credit for it. But it's to compare the rules on international transfers to local planning laws on listed buildings. That's, it, that's probably something which is more relevant to a barrister, perhaps, than to me. But I think it's a really good way to look at it. If the rules on listed buildings are too loose, then all kinds of developments are going to spring up. But similarly, if the rules are too restrictive, then people are just going to ignore them and take the risk that they'll be challenged. Um, the planning office won't know that you've removed that listed staircase in your hallway and replaced it with a modern, modern one. So they need to find a sweet spot where the rules are sensible and not unduly bureaucratic. And of course, it's obvious, but the same applies to international transfers. If our legal framework is too loose, then the data is going to lose protection and that's not good for individuals or for society. This is probably where we were, I would say, before SHREMS 2. 
But if the rules are too bureaucratic and difficult, then exporters are either going to ignore the rules, play lip service to them, and just accept some level of risk. So in when we're addressing what the framework is, we need to find a middle way. But of course, that's easier, much easier said than done. I've got a history as being both a data protection lawyer and a contract lawyer. So I'm always trying to look at which is the party best place to manage risk. Um, but the difficulty here is that you can split that risk between exporters, importers, governments, and of course, regulators. And actually, who is best placed to manage the risk will depend on the resource of the parties and the risks associated with the data. Um, for example, it should be possible for a large organization to obtain legal advice on these issues. For example, could governments and regulators provide guidance on third countries, but what are the wider political implications of that? For example, um, the importer may have the resource to undertake this exercise once and sign up to a code or a certification scheme, which the exporters can then rely on. And it comes back to that key point, we don't have a one size fits all model. And even within your financial services sector, I would suggest that there are still a wide range of organizations with different level of resource and expertise here that you need to take into consideration when you're thinking about what, how your sector can respond to these challenges. Moving on to, to share with you some of the ICO's priorities in our work here. And I'm going to start with the macro priority, which flows from the Article 8 right to privacy. We need to find the right balance between protecting individuals and wider societal needs. Sometimes it's simple and sometimes it's not. And data transfers is a really good example of how Article 8 is devolved into UK GDPR. And if you think about the derogations, they are quite an obvious and straightforward iteration of when the balance lies with making a transfer and potentially losing all of your data protection and privacy rights because the needs of others or society at large is, is greater in, that, in those very specific situations. But then when you try and look at Article 8 in the context of essential equivalence or sufficiently similar and appropriate safeguards, this is where it gets more difficult because we have to lean heavily on trying to find that balance within Article 8 and between the different fundamental rights. We do understand that like data localization does not bring with it universal benefits and could in fact cause much more harm to individuals. And then I wanted to go on to some of our the specific example of the current work streams and priorities that we're working on at the moment. Um, working alongside government to provide advice in relation to its adequacy assessments. We are updating our guidance in particular on derogations in Article 46, and that should be coming out, let's say soon. We are updating guidance on our IDTA and addendum and how to conduct risk assessments. Again, hopefully that should be coming out soon. Um, and then once we've got those last two work streams, that will then help to unlock others. So we'll be looking with BCRs. Are there ways to streamline the process, build in the risk assessment and maybe open up BCRs to smaller businesses? And of course, I think possibly most relevant to this paper is we, we will be looking at how we can use codes and certs for transfers. And I think we keep saying this, we are, our door is well and truly open for any, anyone who wants to come to us with proposals as to how a code or certification scheme can be used or adapted for international transfers. I am particularly keen on this model for BCRs and codes and certs where it is the importer that takes the lead and undertakes the hard work and assessments once and then any number of exporters can then reply, rely on it. And that seems so appropriate where we have these matrices of global data flows and multiple onward transfers that it seems to be the only, well, it's not never going to be the only one, but it will be a, a cornerstone of any international transfers regime is some something like that. Um, then sort of looking more widely and looking to the rest of the world, I think it's also worth um, mentioning that the good news and the bad news is that data protection laws are proliferating. And this obviously poses a, produces a massive benefit to individuals, but I am worried that it could mean that global transfers are going to get ever more difficult as we have even more different regimes for how global transfers can take place. 
of course the final answer has to be some global standards but and i'm going to say this quietly is i'm not sure how long that's going to take and how in, in any case how would it address this issue of conflicts with local laws and particularly local surveillance laws so i think that's going to be difficult and i think it's going to take a, a long time um but i do agree with the report about the benefit of recognitions for third countries and that sort of goes back to who is best to assess and manage the risk of local laws and that has to be governments it's at that level it's just not always that straightforward and i would posit a question whether there could be different degrees of assessment which could then be topped up with an article 46 transfer tool but then, and speaking more loudly, I would absolutely echo much of this report in the short to medium bridges. These hubs could be at country level. So we have the EU and the countries it has declared to be adequate. That's one hub. CBPRs, there's another hub. And we need to explore whether it's possible to build bridges to those CBPRs, you know, using an Article 46 transfer tool. But more pragmatically and maybe more quickly, these hubs could be designed by sectors and businesses, and we would wholeheartedly support financial services. If you can come up with a hub set of core data protection terms, then with bridges or add-ons for specific regimes, and which could also incorporate a transfer risk assessment. I would urge you in your planning though, to, to think about two other things, which are data subjects, Remember in Article 46, there's that cornerstone requirement of effective and enforceable data subject rights. And I would challenge your sector to think about ways that you can enable cross-border complaints and enforcement through a straightforward dispute resolution procedure. I would also say, don't forget about the derogations. They're a really important part of the balance in Article 8, um, right to privacy. Um, when you're looking at risk assessments, you can naturally flow into looking at derogations. And you may recall the letter that the ICO sent to the SEC in the US, which set out that transfers from its UK regulated entities could fall within the Article 49.1D um, derogation as being for important reasons of public interest. You may find that in your sector that certain bridges out of your hub may be made via a derogation or a combination of a derogation and a transfer tool. So after all that, and to try and pull all this together before passing on to Isabel, who's going to come up with the solutions for us, um, I would urge us all, including the ICO, including government, including your sector, to let's all try a bit harder to come up with some innovative solutions for transfers. We're working on it. We're trying to come up with some of these, and we would very much support the financial services sector in your endeavours in this space. Um, thank you very much. And uh, Isabel, I think it's time to pass over to you. Thanks very much, Emma. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think just for a little bit of further context on the IRSD's paper on the future of international transfers, it's just worth looking back at why has the IRSD chosen now to focus on what the future of international data transfers looks like and produce a report about an alternative future. We've seen just in the last week that the subject of international data transfers is not only being looked at by data protection professionals, but they are in fact on the agenda of world leaders. <clears throat> With the increasing legal, regulatory, political and societal scrutiny of the sharing of not only personal data, but all data, in this report, the IRSD passionately discusses what the, the future of international data transfers may look like on the current trajectory and the negative effect of that trajectory in a world where we are seeing an increase in data sharing and digitization, and that data is not separated into needs, but it is a mix of personal data, financial data, and also confidential data. Restrictions in data sharing threaten to stifle customer service and increase compliance burdens. And the IRSD is advocating for action to be taken to change that direction <clears throat> and to increase certainty for individuals, society, industry, and public bodies on how all data may be responsibly shared. There is no suggestion in the report that data should not be adequately protected, rather that the data may be better 
and more consistently protected if a new global approach around international data transfers can be established. As we are increasingly reliant on access to all types of data, there is a huge opportunity to unlock the advantages that sharing of data can give to society, including education, knowledge sharing, trade deals, cross-border collaboration, increased job opportunities, access to digital products and services, and financial products for customers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. The report looks at the current ways in which international data transfers are facilitated under different legal frameworks around the world, and the ways in which these diverging states of legislation, regulation, guidance, and cultures on data sharing are impeding transfers and all the benefits that come with them. It explores how current legal frameworks would benefit from a more holistic, global set of standards that would decrease complexity, cost, and also risk. The current patchwork global legislative framework and data transfer mechanisms are currently heavily focused on binary transfer me mechanisms and simplistic data transfer scenarios. Whereas in fact, they do not reflect the, reali the reality of multiple ongoing data access requirements and sharing at scale. The report contains three recommendations one short term, one medium term, and one long term. And Patrick, can I just check that you have that slide up, please? Thank you. And if you could move on to the recommendations, please. Thank you. So these are the three recommendations which the IRSG presents to address the need for a modern, flexible, accountable, and multilateral approach to international data transfer. Any new approach will need to address challenges from a wide ranging set of perspectives, taking into account the practical realities of data sharing and evolving technologies. The legal position, individual rights, as Emma referred to, cost efficiency, operationalization, and implementation, and whether the measures achieve the desired outcome. All stakeholders need to be represented in these discussions. In the short term, and this is an approach that we're seeing in some jurisdictions already, is the call for acceleration of legitimacy assessments, legitimacy assessments of third countries who have strong data protection cultures to recognize and accept the legitimacy of differing cultural and societal approaches to data handling. Now, the benefit of this recommendation is heavily reliant both on the ability to accelerate these decisions and the mutuality of these decisions. And Emma has already referred to the fact that some of these decisions do take a considerable amount of time and these assessments can take a considerable amount of time. And that means that they often, that they might not be a viable short-term solution if they are not able to keep up with the pace of innovation and the needs of business in what is already a global digital economy. Given the number of countries with laws which protect actually different types of data, this solution, this solution to be viable, there would need to be a global call for acceleration due to the number of assessments that would need to be, to be undertaken. In the intermediate term, the recommendation is to move away from using bilateral agreements, which cover specific projects and transfers, and develop multilateral agreements, which can be underpinned by the adoption of codes of conduct and certifications. These may be developed cross-jurisdictionally by, by industry, and they would need the input and support of industry bodies and data regulators and underpinned by a strong governance framework. The current bilateral agreements cover a myriad of issues, but are in the most part invisible to anyone who's not a party to that particular agreement, including the affected customers. By introducing codes of conduct and certifications which industry is consulted on and feeds into, which are enforceable by regulators, we would have more certainty and reduce the strain both on firms and regulators, particularly smaller organizations who, again, as, as Emma referred to, struggle to handle the current divergence of compliance requirements. 
by enabling smaller market participants to engage and comply, we would see an increase um, and benefits both in competition and, in, and innovation. Published codes of conduct also have the benefit of providing that, that additional transparency that's needed for customers and therefore assurance to those whose data is being handled, whether those customers are organizations or individuals. Finally, the third preferred and strongest solution and recommendation is for the development and adoption of an international scheme based on mutually acceptable principles of free flow of data with trust that multiple countries feel confident to adopt, implement, and very importantly, to promote. Global principles should focus on outcomes, not on process and rigid procedures. To achieve this, regulators may move away from mapping one specific legal approach and agree on an international consensus of standards for protection, which can be based on established standards of protection of data that we already have around the world. This approach is not discriminate, but is all encompassing and requires governance, enforceability and measurement, as well as adherence on a government by government basis. There are a number of potential approaches to take this forward including in the form of recommendations and grading, similar to how the Financial Action Task Force tackles financial crime. These principles may also leverage the OECD privacy principles and guidelines on the protection of privacy and transport of flows of personal data. But that was the strong caveat that any principles should not only address personal data, but all data. However, the IRSC's recommendations on a global set of principles may be progressed it should be implemented and used with the overarching intention to promote stronger data protection across all jurisdictions. And now that we've presented the results of the report, I'd like to hand over to Vivian Pili for the panel discussion. Isabel, thank you so very much for providing that overview of the report, which we worked long and hard on together with all of the members in the IRSG. Absolutely super. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vivian Arts, and I am the chair of the IRSG Data Committee, um, Senior Data Strategy and Privacy Policy Advisor to the Centre for Information Policy Leadership. And I'm also delighted to be on the UK International Data Transfers Expert Council. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our online panel discussion today. Um, I see that some of you have already started putting questions in the Q&A box. I would encourage anyone else to continue to do so, and we will tackle those as our panel discussion progresses. But without further ado, please let me introduce our panelists. Firstly, we have Professor Elizabeth Coombs, Associate Professor at the University of Malta. She's also chair of the International Committee, Australian Privacy Foundation, and immediate past privacy commissioner for New South Wales in Australia. Welcome, Elizabeth. I'd also like to introduce Laurie Baker, who is vice president, legal and director of data protection at the Dubai International Financial Center, or DIFC, as we like to call it where she provides data protection and security strategy and support in one of the leading financial centers in the MEASA, I'm going to say MISA region. Hi there, Laurie. Joe, Joe Jones, welcome. Joe is the Deputy Director for International Data Transfers at the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. Joe and his colleagues at DCMS have crafted the UK's new data transfer strategy and have been consulting closely with the Information Commissioner's Office. And of course, Isabel Ost. Hello, Isabel. Isabel is Head of Data Protection for KPMG Law. Isabel is a commercial technology and data protection solicitor, specializing in data protection, transformation and compliance in the financial services sector, and advises clients on data ethics, data sovereignty, data strategy, and international data transfers compliance programs. Thank you all for many different times in which you are located today. To open our discussion with the panel, 
Um, I'd like to call on Joe Jones first. Joe, I wonder if you could just give some reflections on the report and its findings. Um, obviously, we've been very much focused on the financial services sector, but I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about government access to data, because one of the realities we know in the financial services sector that it isn't just about business to business and business to consumer, but also there is so much engagement between business and government as well. Thank you, Vivian, and, and very happy to do that. Uh, but first of all, I want to congratulate you and uh, the RSG community uh, and welcome the paper. Look, I think it's terrific that we're getting these rich, deep uh, and impactful insights from the financial and professional business services community. We, as a government, really welcome that. Uh, just to echo the points that Emma made in her keynote, look, our door is always open uh, and you'll hear us often say, please help us uh, so that we can help you uh, and the wider community on all of these issues. And, and these issues are very difficult uh, and the paper does an excellent job at articulating why and how they're difficult. To be very candid, they're impossibly difficult. Uh, they're impossibly difficult on the issues that you flagged, Vivian, on government access to data. Uh, and let's be frank, those are the issues that dominate today. Those are the issues that we saw uh, in Schrems 2, in the case. Those are the issues that we're seeing permeate uh, and spread across uh, EU regulated guidance. And frankly, those are the issues that are very hard for private organizations to grapple with. How impossibly challenging it must be. Uh, and, this, and this is certainly what we hear as a government through our public consultations and for our, our engagement in industry, how impossibly hard it must be to understand and appreciate how foreign governments access personal data for the purposes of law enforcement and national security purposes. The laws are very often not contained in one neat publicly available place. Uh, and by definition, uh, national security varies in its interpretation and scope, depending on that nation's interests, depending on that nation's culture, on their legal traditions, and their security objectives. Uh, and every nation's security objectives reflect their place in the world. And we're seeing that, of course, in Europe at the moment, in Ukraine. So these are really hard issues, and I very much welcome the approach the RSG has taken to, to chunk what needs to be done into phases. Uh, I think we have to do all of those phases at the same time. We have to start delivering the, on the here and now, so the mechanisms we've got today, data adequacy decisions, new transfer mechanisms. We have to have conversations about your interim, uh, the next phase on codes of conduct and certification schemes. And we have to really invest in the longer term multilateral solutions. And on to your question, Vivian, that I have great hope and optimism that we will get there. I think look, there's some great discussions at the OECD, for example, on government access to data. We have got the right experts at the table now. I mean, one of the, uh, and I hate to say it's an upside, but one of the upsides to Schrems 2 is it has brought law enforcement and national security experts to the table to talk about these issues, to try and find solutions, recognizing how important and how impactful those issues are to commercial data sharing. Thank you very much, Joe. I really appreciate your comments there. And I think you make an interesting point as well about um, you know, everyone being brought to the table. So often we've been operating in those different silos of whether it's a sectoral silo or a regulatory silo or a national silo, but actually the, the issues around international data transfers have now reached such a peak and level of importance that it is no longer a legal issue. It is no longer um, just a compliance issue. It is actually a political and international issue as well. And, and hopefully this focus will indeed get the creative juices going as well as the cooperation um, to find some of those solutions which we've uh, been proposing and suggesting um, in, in our paper. Um, Elizabeth, I wonder if I could come to you with a, a different question. Um, 
reflecting some of the comments actually made in the Q&A as well. Obviously, we understand the importance of data um, and the need to transfer data as being critical within both the financial and the professional services sector. It enables the sector to operate and enables people to, to do their jobs. Um, but however, there are some things that are really important at the individual and consumer level as well that need to be addressed. And one of the questions was around, um, you know, where is the balance between um, individuals and their rights in terms of the international transfer pace and I wonder if you would mind to share some thoughts on that. Thank you Vivian and let me add to my voice to you know the appreciation of participating in this event and also the very comprehensive report that's being prepared for presentation and discussion today. I'm really pleased to receive that question about where is the individual in this whole digital economy and my starting point it's not data that needs to be at the center of the digital economy, it's people. And that is one of the fundamental points that I note has not really been conveyed to me in this report. And I know that is, that's probably not the intention, it is about the financial services industry. But these challenges, responses to the challenges of transmitting, you know, transferring data, that doesn't excuse from recognizing the importance to the individual of their rights, but also too of the asymmetry between people and companies and, and also to government. As a representative of the Southern Hemisphere, um, Australia, and I'm sure you can pick that up from my accent, I stress the findings of the Australian Royal Commission quite recently in 2018 into the banking and financial services industry. I'm sure many of you are aware of it, but how clearly those findings demonstrated that regulation of this sector is required as is strong enforcement. And it's very unlikely that the practices and cultural attitudes towards customers that was demonstrated there would be siloed from also attitudes towards their data. And I also just wanted to point out that the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has taken a very strong stance on the critical importance of strong privacy and data protection for achieving, I don't really care to use the balance, but that to get some better mix between the rights of the individual, the needs of the public, and also of having a strong and vibrant economy. And I think this is one of the things which we sometimes miss and I'm, We'd just like to say that as a privacy regulator, I typically found that on many occasions, people would blame the regulatory environment and the regulators for issues which possibly might reside inside their own company and their own industry. We used to call that the BOTPA, B-O-T-P-A. Because of the Privacy Act, I cannot do A, B, C, or through to Z. And when I actually say, show me the evidence for this statement that it's the Privacy Act or the privacy actions that we as a regulator is taking. I found that sometimes it was actually about debates about whose protocols and procedures should prevail, those for who wanted to transfer the data or those who are going to receive it. But sometimes too, that was a distraction and actually issues concerning the quality of the data that was supposedly people wished to either transfer or, or receive. I want to jump to, because the time is so very short. Um, yesterday, I very fortuitously was caught up with Professor Graham Greenleaf, who's you know, one, an expert on international data protection law. And we were speaking about this issue of you know, data transfers, recognizing you know, the challenges which have been so eloquently articulated in this report, and also the risks of not transferring data. And that's you know, obviously a very important aspect as well here. One of the options which he put to me, and this is unpublished work, which will soon be public, but he's given me permission to raise it here, um, although it is not my work. And that to avoid reinventing the wheel, so to speak, but that we should look at what some countries have already done, which is to enact that data exports are allowed to, for example, or specifically actually, member countries of the EU, or the EEA, that's roughly 30 countries, countries with a positive adequacy finding from the EU under the GTPR, currently around 13 
15 countries and expanding. And thirdly, countries that are parties to Convention 108 plus, and that's 57, of, of which 27 are not in the EU or the EEA. A number, you know, which two is um, also expanding. So if a country does that in acting, it actually allows potentially or data exports to around 65 countries, a number that will probably will continue to expand automatically with more adequacy decisions and more accessions to Convention 108 plus. And the examples that he provided to me just to sort of add substance to those points is of the countries that have enacted along those lines. And these include Israel, which allows transfers to a database in the country, which is party to Convention 108, and possibly, he thinks, to member states of the EU on a reciprocal basis, following a positive adequacy finding. Ukraine, where member states of the EEA, as well as state signatory to Convention 108, shall be assumed to ensure an adequate level of personal data protection. Serbia, and I won't repeat the actual wording there, and also Russia. So I think some of the, that suggestion is worthy of some consideration um, in the report. Now, just very, very sort of quickly, um, when we speak about reaching common principles and you know, a global set of principles, fully endorse that. I'd just like to bring forward some of the issues from the personal experience, both as a regulator in consumer affairs and privacy, but also I mean, in other roles as negotiating between Commonwealth state matters. And that was ever so quickly how trying to find common ground and agreement became a race to the lowest common denominator where you established what was common ground, but then there was a reluctance to move beyond that to get to higher standards. And you know, this is for practicality reasons and sometimes political reasons. And so these are just a few notes that I'd like to raise in relation to matters which possibly have not been canvassed in, in this report, despite its very great strengths and the work that has gone into it. Thanks, Vivian. Um, um, and, you know, I think one of the things that we did focus on in terms of the report was the benefits to customers, both institutional and individual, um, for the transfer of personal data, um, enabling them to have access to choices which they may not otherwise um, be able to, to, to um, uh, access. Um, that was actually a really, really useful reminder. Thank you. Laurie, I wonder if I could move to you and ask you a question um, just around emphasis, because a lot of the discussion and the focus in the paper has been around um, sort of EU, UK, as well as more broadly. But um, there, there is a bigger picture here. It isn't just an EU, UK, US uh, issue. It's actually an international issue. And it would be great to hear a little bit of perspective from DIFC and how you're viewing the international landscape and how that is evolving um, in terms of the trajectory suggested by um, the report today. Thank you, Vivian. Happy to. Um, in DIFC, we're very firmly outside of any of those jurisdictions that uh, you mentioned quite, quite a long way away. Um, but we've adopted uh, most of the principles, uh, you know, directly from the original directive in 1995 to through to the GDPR, UK GDPR, and other principles from around the world as well that work for us and developed our own um, kinds of um, additional bits uh, for our law that makes sense for this jurisdiction. We're very heavily tech focused and, and development focused in that regard. Uh, here in the UAE and in the DIFC specifically. So we've always had in mind that adequacy is only one mechanism. It's not the only mechanism. And um, we need to keep reminding ourselves of that. I think it's you know, a rather obvious statement when you hear it out loud, but um, you know, we, we focus so heavily on the concept that you know, adequacy means I don't have to do anything else. Sometimes you should do something else in addition to 
the adequacy mechanism that you can use. I mean, simply because you're sending data to a place that has been recognized by an entirely other regulator as adequate, doesn't necessarily mean that it's adequate for the transfer that you're undertaking. So we encourage our companies, we've set it in our guidance, we put it into our export assessment tools um, and all the things that we're working on here, which I'll get to in a minute, one of them, um, you know, while you can rely on adequacy, sometimes you shouldn't, and you can go ahead and insist that we want to use the SECs or some sort of enhanced data sharing agreement or bolstered data protection clauses just within your framework agreement, whatever it is that you think is necessary, uh, regular audits, you know, and encouraging further um, compliance kind of mechanisms, you know, it, it can't hurt. It's only going to help, um, especially in jurisdictions where data protection as a concept, a legal concept is, is evolving and, and maturing really is, is the better word for it. And that's quite a lot of the jurisdictions around the world. I mean, it's only in the last five years that the bulk of the new data protection laws based on old data protection concepts have come to the fore. Um, you know, so, and as you said, I, I think somebody mentioned along the way that yes, it, it's not um, a huge chunk of countries that have been determined as adequate, even though they're sitting there on the sidelines going, yeah, we have the same law and we do all the same things. Um, but we're not adequate yet for whatever reason. And, and there are usually good reasons for that. So, you know, I'll do credit to the assessors that, that make those determinations. We in DIFC, just to give some examples of what's, you know, going on outside of that sphere, we have done our own adequacy assessments and decisions. We've issued them and said, you know, for our purposes, for being distinctly a financial center that does have other elements to it, but you know, we have a large chunk of um, regulated entities that are financial services entities and DNFBPs. Um, maybe it only works for us to give recognition on the, um, a countries or another jurisdictions like ours, like maybe Qatar Financial Center or ADGM or something like that, to say, for now, it's a program where you can send data to another regulated entity in that jurisdiction um, through our adequacy recognition. But if they're not you probably need to do a lot more um, to ensure that this transfer is safe. Uh, we're also about to publish our, and we're getting there very close. I know we've been talking about it for ages, but a risk index for data protection, very much like the Transparency International Index. It's a supplementary tool. So it's not around corruption per se, but it does actually incorporate the Transparency International corruption rating that we've worked on and sort of adapted for our own purposes in DIC, you know, recognizing that for, for example, corruption in a certain jurisdiction may mean that not only are um, laws and regulations generally not complied with by companies, but maybe they're, it's specifically around things like data protection might see a bit of cutting corners and so on. So we've incorporated that actually into our index assessment for about 50 countries so far. Um, it can be used because it covers exactly what SHREMS uh, needs a company to cover in terms of government and public authority access to data, but it, it covers a, a whole lot more than that. And our index rating can then be substantiated by the actual uh, narratives of the assessments as well. And will be then sent to or published as a tool that companies can use. We may actually require them to use it to ask an additional eight to 12 questions. We haven't quite finalized the list, but you know, looking at, as I said before, what the company itself that you're sending the data to does, just because it sits in a jurisdiction that has been recognized or not recognized, has data protection laws, has a culture, has what have you, um, doesn't mean that that company is actually complying every single time. And we all know that is a fact. I mean, you know, we have this ongoing debate over, you know, Silicon Valley companies that are in fact EU companies. I mean, they're based in Ireland. They have offices all over the place in, in the EU. You know, if one Google Spain is all Google, then, you know, they're actually under that, that sort of remit of the GDPR anyway. That's a whole other story perhaps, but in any case, um, you know, it's to look at the company itself as a whole 
and determine whether or not what you know, what you're sending to or the data that you're sharing with that company is actually going to be protected by them. Uh, having a right, you know, recognized law that's in place is quite similar to mine is all well and good if the company isn't going to do anything with it to comply. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. We're also working with the World Alliance of International Financial Centers as well on a similar kind of block concept. Um, you know, could we as international financial centers all around the world engage to create a data sharing block similar to maybe this GDPRs or adequacy recognition or what have you? Um, it, we haven't launched it yet. It's still very much, you know, sort of under discussion. Um, you know, I don't want to say that they've committed to anything at all, but um, it is something that I think would be a really helpful way of actually approaching this. And um, maybe if we come up with that kind of organizational block um, from a financial services center perspective, uh, we'll get a lot further in, in changing how we think about data transfers around the world. Thank, thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Laurie. That's really interesting, actually. And I think the, the sectoral approach is one that has been discussed quite um, as to whether or not that can perhaps um, achieve the level of consistency and high standards that we're seeking in terms of international transfers, given the regulated aspect of the sector. Um, but another area that's of tremendous focus for the financial services sector is ESG. Um, and of course, it's, it's not mandated by law, but it is expected by customers and uh, shareholders and um, by consumers. So. Uh, Isabel, could you just perhaps a few words on the ESG transparency and what that means in the context of data and data transfers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, a huge element around ESG is, is around, you know, what, what data do you use to measure ESG? And when we look at ESG, there's, you know, there's society, society governance, and all of that is going to be measured by data. Um, you're going to have different data points that you need to look at. And Although, as, as we've, we've said a number of times, we don't recommend that data should be any less protected um, than, the, than the consumer has the right to have their data protected. But what we do need is organizations to be able to access data internationally in order to measure um, how well they are addressing their ESG strategies and agendas as well. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we're coming toward the end of our time, but I still want to pull on some of the questions that have been coming through. So Joe, I wonder if I could ask um, one of the questions to you, please. It's one that we, we get often, and it's a, it's a prevailing area of concern, um, which is to say, um, uh, in the short to medium term, do you see the UK continuing to operate within the constraints of maintaining EU adequacy? And there's a bit of a follow on, which is um, how realistic is a meaningful international agreement or scheme? Um, and how would that really address the Schrems to concerns? <laughs> Great questions. Um, and of course, I would give the answers that you'd expect me to give. But look, and uh, I've actually been speaking with my counterparts in the European Commission today. And, uh, and in not as many words, adequacy is not a constraining mechanism for them. It is not intended or designed to either export EU standards or to keep countries locked in to EU standards. Uh, the EU, I should flag, uh, is engaged in these exercises in the same way that we are. Right? They are speaking uh, with international partners on these issues. They are engaging at the OECD. Uh, they, like us, are looking to promote global data flows. Now, the UK has, uh, and I really believe we're uniquely well placed to do some of this. Uh, we are looking outwards. We are having discussions not just in the transatlantic, not just in the UK EU context, but with partners around the world. So I do think the UK is very well placed to do this. Bringing the EU with us is a critically important part to that. On the uh, optimistic, realistic, pessimistic on a, a global solution here, there is precedent for this, right? And of course, today, all of these issues are super national. Um, there, there's a great deal of fragmentation as the IOSG paper flags, but we have been here before in other contexts. There have been uh, examples where international, supranational bodies have come together 
to find commonality, whether that's the Convention of the Council of Europe, whether that's the OECD, the World Trade Organization, G7, G20, there is precedent here. And we need to invest in those opportunities because it, it's frankly not sustainable to continue with a model that sees the level of fragmentation that we're seeing proliferate and worse, deepen. Uh, so that we're at that inflection point that we have to invest in those multilateral conversations. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Joe, for your very eloquent um, response. We only have a few minutes left, so actually I wanted to take this opportunity just to thank everyone for participating today um, and to suggest that you have a look in the chat. We've actually put a link there to the report, uh, which you can download and access and share. Um, and I hope you enjoy reading it. And if you have any comments or queries, um, it would be delight we'd be delighted to hear from you um, in relation to that. It was, uh, I think we managed to cut it down by about two thirds, didn't we, Isabel? It was a much bigger report before uh, to make it a little bit more digestible. But uh, firstly, I want to thank everyone today to uh, Kay Swinburne, who is our chair for opening the event, uh, to Emma Bates from the ICO for her keynote um, comments, uh, which was just spot on, thank you. And of course, to our amazing uh, panelists, uh, Laurie, Elizabeth, Joe, and Isabel. If I can just recap on some of the takeaways I have from the event, um, and I'm sure as, given the richness of the discussion, you probably have many more as well. But um, some of the things that resonated with me was the local planning um, analogy around needing to find a solution which is not too harsh, um, but it is not too loose. We absolutely don't want to end up with a situation where um, we, we fall to the lowest common denominator. And we've, we've heard some, some clear messages on that as well. The solution that we're looking for needs to be accessible to all types of organizations. It needs to be able to address the flow of data between governments and governments and business, between businesses and all those other types of organizations out there. Um, limited companies aren't the only uh, uh, data controllers out there and ensuring a safeguarding for um, individuals' data is, has to be absolutely the, the focus and the core. Um, I'm also, uh, took note of the fact that we need to consider who is best placed to manage the risk. And I think that that's actually a really good compass for us to be thinking about, which is when there is risk, who is best placed to manage it? And are we architecting in a way that we can actually address that issue and concern? Uh, privacy in practice, not just on paper. Well, that's one of the things I like to say, um, which is what we're looking for here is a solution that isn't just about um, ticking the box and saying, have you done this or have you done that? But actually, what does that look like in practice? And is it meaningful for individuals? And is it impactful for the digital economy in which we are operating today? Um, and then, of course, that reminder that the risks um, in, in data transfers aren't just about the transferring of data, but also if we don't transfer data. What are the risks that we face if we don't transfer data? Um, and finally, it was really useful to have those international overviews and perspectives about what's happening elsewhere in terms of international transfers. And that supports a lot of what we've been saying in the report is that there are so many different mechanisms, requirements, rules, regulations, expectations, using different tools in order to achieve what are fundamentally similar objectives. And I think this is the call to everyone in our community and more broadly to have a look at those mechanisms. Can we find something that is going to be much more consistent, that is going to be meaningful to the individual, a point that Isabel made so eloquently, um, not a background tool that no one can see, but a foreground tool that is accessible to individuals and, and is enforceable to ensure proper standards and safe transfers of data for everyone. So there's obviously a will, we just need to find the way. And I think we're spot on 12. So thank you very much everyone for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the report and thank you for joining. Take care, bye-bye.